Welcome to the Check Your Privilege Ally Talks with me, Maisha T. These are interviews that I'm hosting with allies to see what work they're doing to keep their privilege in check and offer safe spaces for Black, Indigenous women of color. I have with me Sarah, who is referred by Candace Smith. Sarah, can you tell the audience who you are and what you do? Yes, I am working at the intersection of women's health and spirituality and science. And I am an integrative women's health coach. I am a women's health researcher. And I work with women mostly who are overcoming depression, anxiety, and chronic fatigue conditions and really at the threshold of stepping into a new way of living and being. And I use the tools of science, of functional nutrition, of ritual, and of yoga and meditation, and um, also of symbolism and mythic imagination. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and in this work, are you, do you find yourself working with other women of color in the work that you do? Mostly my clients are white women. Oh. Okay. Now, do you think that's by choice or is it just kind of just the way it's kind of shown up for you? I think it's the way it's showing up for me. Um, my, my current business as it exists right now is unfolding in a lot of different directions. And I don't really market myself. I don't have a website. It's all word of mouth referrals at this point. So the women who are showing up are white women and... I believe it's because of my background and uh, who I am. And I feel that white women have, all, all women have, you know, certain things in common. And then white women have our own set of things that we need to work on. And um, so I feel like that's who's coming to me right now. I would love to work with women of color as well. And I also feel that there are certain things that I can't necessarily support a woman of color through because I don't have that experience myself. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll see what happens after this work. So may I ask if you, Sarah, identify as a feminist? I absolutely do. Hmm. I've always identified as a feminist. And in, in your work as a feminist, um, have you noticed the um, silencing of Black, Indigenous, women of color in the movement? Yes, I absolutely have. And I uh, feel that the feminist movement up until this point in history has absolutely privileged the voices of white women over the voices of women of color and indigenous women, um, and as well as over the voices of trans women. And uh, I feel what I see happening right now is the awareness that that's a problem is I think becoming more widespread. And, um, and then in that awareness, there's also the resistance that comes from the people who have typically carried the torch or had the power. And so I think um, it's an interesting time and mm -hmm. uh, it's a challenging time, but the challenges that we face as women are so are so pervasive we're not going to be able to overcome them separately anymore and so we have to create and build a more inclusive movement hmm. i love that i love that thank you for sharing that a lot of times we um i haven't had too many people share that experience and, and from that level of perspective um as part of you being in this feminist movement has there been times where you may have said something or spoken up for the lack of women in the movement, like in maybe your small social circles? Mm. Yes. Um, so 
so I'm involved in a lot of different spiritual circles, Mm -hmm. women's spiritual circles, and all of them are predominantly white spaces. And um, this is something that's been hugely problematic for me for a long time. And, um, and yet I understand the reluctance of women of color to participate in certain spaces that are dominated by white women, particularly spiritual spaces. Mm-hmm. So, um, one of the things I try to call attention to is how are we not creating a safe space? Mm. How are we, you know, unconsciously creating this space where women of color don't feel included or don't want to participate? And, and I think there's, I think there's an appropriate space for, um, for separation. You know, I think women of color need to have their own circles. And I think white women need to have our own circles where we can actually process and unpack racism and white supremacy. um, You know, kind of in our own safe space. Yeah. And so I think there's a place for that. But then there's also a really important need for us to come together and in spaces that are not specifically for the unpacking and processing of these issues, particularly feminist spaces, spiritual spaces, we need to be able to create spaces that are inclusive. So, Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I think I could for sure be more vocal. Yeah. Well, what's interesting in, in a lot of the spiritual spaces um, that I've been in with white women, a lot of the, the practices are rooted in indigenous culture. Yes. So I've always wondered, like, has anyone spoke to that? Like, this is actually an indigenous practice from here. And like, how do you, I understand the need to have our own spiritual spaces for our own, like for white women and for black women. But when we come together, I guess I've always just been curious, wondering, how do we give respect to the culture that the practice came from without taking ownership and of that experience or of that practice? So for example, I went to a spiritual space in Berkeley um, and someone came up to me and said they were a Reiki practitioner from an African indigenous country. And so for me, I was offended and I didn't feel safe because it's like, Mm. why would you say that to me? Or were you saying that to me to build community? So I've always mm. wondered in those type of spiritual spaces when I haven't felt the safest is I think part of it was because they didn't give reverence to the culture it came from, me being a woman of color and knowing that it was that type of practice. Yes. Yeah. This is so important. Yeah. To talk about. <laughs> so I'm this always just so curious important. as to, in your experience with like that, when it's mm-hmm. just an all white woman, has there been reverence given to the culture that it came from? Or is it a spiritual practice? Yes. So in some cases, yes. And in some cases, no. And my feeling about this is I I currently study and practice in two lineages, Mm -hmm. neither of which are from my background of origin. So for me, what's really important in studying and practicing those lineages is that the focus is on the lineage and the lineage teachings Mm -hmm. and deep, deep reverence and honor is given to the lineage and the lineage teachers and that the lineage itself is also sanctioning the transmission of the lineage to white people. That's important to me. Got it. And also you know, I don't, I don't want to be judgmental about the way other people are living and being in the world. But for me personally, I am not comfortable, you know, making these big social media posts about the practices that I'm doing or um, showing photos of the rituals that I'm engaged in because to me, it feels like a, just, you know, I'm like, it's not mine. Mm -hmm. 
it's not mine and I don't want to claim it as mine. Yeah. And yet it's something that I'm in deep, deep gratitude to. Mm -hmm. I appreciate so, that because that's, as my mom would say, spiritual perversion. Right. <laughs> from another culture, but then you make it to be some show or make it to be all about you. So I appreciate right. that. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, let's move into a little bit about allyship. Um, so we all know that allyship is not an identity, but it's this process of building relationships on trust, consistency, and accountability with marginalized groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, it's not self-defined, but it's just like this daily intentional practice. So um, what does being an ally look like to you? Yeah, so I love what you said about being a daily intentional practice because mm -hmm. I get a little bit uncomfortable when people call themselves allies or um, say they you know, want to be an ally or when people even call me an ally because it's not, it's not something you are or you aren't. It's in any given moment, how are you showing up? Mm -hmm. And um, so for me, showing up as an ally in any given moment means consciously and intentionally using my time, my energy, my attention to focus on how I can support the struggle for liberation mm -hmm. that's happening for marginalized people. And um, to me, it shows up as taking concrete action. I think it's really important. There's also the, the need to unpack internally, the need to unlearn, yeah. the need to acknowledge our racism, our complicity with white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Um, it has to be acknowledged and we have to, you know, experience kind of the discomfort and the pain of that acknowledgement and the, and the grief around mm -hmm. that. But I also think it's important to not get stuck there and to turn that into, um, turn that into action in the world. Mm. So speaking of action in the world, knowing allyship requires this work, what are you doing to unpack your own privilege? Yeah. So for me, the way that I've chosen to get involved is politically. And um, that's always, politics has always been something that I've been interested in and it's always been something that I've felt really necessary to participate in. So um, right now, I feel like the thing that I want to do most is support women of color who are running for office. Hmm. And um, so that's kind of what I've been up to, I, I would say, this year in terms of my activism. And, um, but there are so many other ways you know, there are so many other ways to show up. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like as white women, whatever we feel called to, whatever direction we feel called to, we need to ask ourselves, how can we incorporate this level of activism in that space? Yeah. So you being a supporter in the political movement around women of color, being put in office, is just kind of one of the steps you're doing to make sure that you're unpacking your own privilege by supporting yes. women of color moving into office. Yes. Like that. Thank you. Um, yeah. And, and I also, you know, think it's important to continually be educating ourselves, paying attention to the voices of women of color who are putting their work out there. Um, you know, making sure we're getting a balanced viewpoint and um, making sure that we're, you know, decolonizing our, not just our psyches, but our news feeds and our, you know, media sources and all of yeah. that. Oh, I, oh yeah, Sarah, I love the decolonizing our news feed, our sources. <laughs> That's real talk. If I had a hashtag, it'd be like hashtag real talk. 
real talk. <laughs> that didn't come from me. I can't take credit for it. I don't remember who said it, but it landed for me. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I'm going to move a little bit into white women violence and weapons of whiteness. So before mm -hmm. you were invited to this interview, have you heard of that term before? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then um, your, your explanation of it in your, the um, readings that you sent kind of helped solidify it a lot. Okay. So in, in your understanding of those terms, have you ever used your whiteness as a weapon against women of color? Mm. So in, intentionally, I'll say intentionally. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't remember doing it intentionally, but I'm sure I have, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, and this is the thing. So much of this is operating just as our default setting unconsciously. Yeah. And, um, there is, you know, and I have noticed in myself and in kind of, you know, other white women, there is a certain amount of, you know, I, I'm just going to use the word fragility because yeah. I think that's an accurate word to describe it. And it's, this is not to blame or shame white women, but it is to just acknowledge what's real and what's there. Mm -hmm. And um, when women of color are sharing with us your experience, I think it's really, really important that we just, whatever feelings we're having, it's fine to have feelings, but we need to not make the woman of color responsible for them. And... Um, we need to really be responsible for our own reactions and our own feelings and our own triggers and then process them in spaces where we can be supported in processing those without putting that burden on women of color. Yeah. Do your own labor. Yeah. That that's really important. Has a woman of color ever told you that you've offended her? And if, if, if we have, or she has, mm -hmm. how did you prepare that? Um, I haven't. Uh, been told that, but you know, I've had conversations with my friends who are women of color, and um, you know, I've been called out on certain things, mm -hmm. and um, and I've never felt attacked, you know. But it it it's just been like, oh, okay, I see, I see how that looked, I see that perspective, and you know, personally, I appreciate it. It's like, it's not just with women of color, it's with anybody who I'm in a relationship with. Mm -hmm. If something I'm saying or doing is, you know, unconscious, I want to know about it. And, um, and it's never easy to hear. But, no. <laughs> but, you know, we didn't come here for easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, um, I want to go a little bit into throwaway culture, um, mm -hmm. which we both know is rooted in patriarchy, which is also mm -hmm. rooted in white supremacy. And so I always use this example, um, you know, for we us as women, when we go to a man and we're being over emotional. It's like, get your feelings out of the way. Just that's just mm -hmm. too much. For you. Just doing too much. Just back away. And so mm -hmm. the idea is what's happening right now in these spaces, in these separate identity groups, as they're Black, Indigenous women of color, are basically saying, you know, I don't feel safe with white women. I'm just going to throw Becky away. I'm going to call her out and just push her to the side. Um, and so the reason that's kind of, kind of why I'm inspired to do these ally talks and host these conversations is because I'm actually interested in building this bridge, right, between Black women and white women. And so what are your ideas around throwing away, um, breaking the cycle of the throwaway culture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I just, I so appreciate what you're doing and that you're creating the space for this conversation to happen. And um, I also, I think if we're on a spiritual growth path, you know, we have to look at everything. Mm -hmm. as a teacher and so when women of color say I'm done with white women you know 
I look at that as also an important thing to hear and understand. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I get it. I get it and I don't get it. <laughs> I get you it. Know. But I just, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> about it. Like I, I can't, I can't get it, you know, I can't yeah. get it fully, but I, but I also do get it. It's like when you have enough negative encounters mm -hmm. with a certain kind of person, eventually you're just going to throw up your hands and be like, I can't do this anymore. You know? Yeah. And, and, you know, when someone throws up their hands and says, I can't do this anymore, maybe they don't necessarily mean forever. Maybe they just need to take some time and space and, and then they'll be ready to come back to the conversation. So I think not getting all reactive to that as white women is really important. You know, it's like if a woman of color kind of makes a proclamation, you know, in social media or wherever that she's not going to talk to white women anymore, it's like, why do we feel the need to come on and, and defend and argue with her? And it's like, no, it's, it's like, let's just listen to that and be like, okay, you know, how can we make it, how can we make it safer? Yeah. How can we invite her back into the conversation? That's it. That's and it. That's actually how you, that's the double fold way of breaking the cycle of throwing people away. Is, mm -hmm. You know, not being fragile and in the comments, but really centering yourself and saying, okay, what have I done or what, ha what has been done to offend this woman where she feels like she can't connect and to reach out for connection. Mm -hmm. um, so when was the last time you may have centered a woman of color in your life or in your business? Um, Centering them in a way where they had full permission to take up the space in a room or full permission to lead. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, the example that's coming to mind is um, uh, there was a candidate who I was supporting running for um, district attorney here in Oakland in the last primary election. And um, So, you know, I, I hosted a house party for her and I just um, really kind of promoted her publicly and, um, and she was an incredible candidate and unfortunately she did not win the election, but I feel like she made a lot of progress towards the converse, opening the conversation around injustice in the criminal justice system here in Oakland. Mm -hmm. um, so... I, I want to do more of that, you know, in my work, I work mostly one-on-one -on -one with women. So I'm not, um, I haven't created yet the group space that I would love to have to be able to center the voices of more women of color. Um, but as things unfold for me professionally, uh, I look forward to being able to do that. Awesome. Um, go, let's go into co-conspiratorship. Um, mm. Alicia Garza kind of defines this as um, a way for white women to move through the guilt and shame um, and recognizing that people of color didn't create any of this oppressiveness that, that's in the world, but actually helping to take responsibility for the power that we hold to transform conditions. So um, my question is, how would you plan on moving from being an ally, which I think is kind of like a noun, like I'm an ally, to kind mm -hmm. of this action-driven co-conspirator. Yeah, yeah, I love what you just said about, um, you know, moving through the guilt and shame. I think that's the first step. It's, you know, as white women, if you're, if you are a woman and you're of European descent, we have our own ancestral trauma. You know, our ancestors, our, our f powerful feminine ancestors were burned. Mm -hmm. And so there's, that is a, a really important ancestral trauma for white women to heal in ourselves. And um, because the descendants of the women who were burned, white women who are currently, you know, in the United States and in Europe now, 
are have been recruited, I think, unwittingly as the kind of defenders and upholders of patriarchy. So, yeah, I mean, 53% of us voted for Trump, you know, like. Clearly, that trauma is still in their bodies. Yeah, yeah, for an admitted sexual assailant, you know. So I think we have to dig deep into our own ancestral stuff and um, we have to do our own trauma healing. And then from that place, we can be strong and not fragile when someone else's, when we come face to face with someone else's trauma. Oh, this is so good. Like you, like, I don't want to have favorites, but I think this is one of my most engaging <laughs> conversations because I've never oh, had you. someone talk about the trauma of white women. And that being the reason why there's so much fragility and, and white supremacy and wow, that's, that's really deep. Just because I know what trauma is for me as a woman of color and how all of us as a woman of color are working to, to break that cycle and that lineage and get that out of our bodies. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is something that white women need to hear right now. Is that yeah. it's just the here and now, it's something that came from our ancestors and it's something that needs to be released and let go of. Yeah. And if, if, you know, we had also, you know, for people who had ancestors who literally owned slaves, you know, that's trauma. That's like, you know, that needs to be healed and worked with. It's like, we got to get right with our past. So kind of going off key here. So if, if there was a white woman who was watching and she knew that Uncle Sam, her grandfathers had slaves. What's like one thing that she could do to get that trauma out of her body? Kind of going off topic, but just mm -hmm. wondering since we're here. I think she's got to be willing to go deep into what that really means and look at it and grieve. She's got to grieve the hell out of it. You know, it's like there's, there's no way to, I mean, she has to sob into the earth, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, We've got to stop, we've got to stop suppressing, suppressing this stuff. It's got to come out. And I also think, you know, at a certain point, but this is tricky because it's like, you know, it's, it's the, again, the putting of emotional labor on women of color, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, there's a, I think there's a desire to make amends. There has to be that desire to make amends and to heal the trauma of the past. But also it's like, we don't want to be going to women of color being like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. You know, it's right. like. <laughs> right, and they were just like, what are you sorry for? Like, you know, <laughs> I know. have been there, let's move forward. <laughs> like, All right, crazy lady, you know. Um, but but I, I think it really comes down to just like doing that emotional work ourselves and doing it deep and not being afraid of it. So it's really like just talking to you now and having a deeper understanding that even allyship or co-conspiratorship, there's not this surface, surface level work, Sarah. There's really this deep rooted work that needs to be done to walk yes. forward together in, in yes. some form of co-conspiratorship. Yes. And then the surface activity kind of happens as a result of that, you know? Yeah. So then you naturally feel like, oh, how can I best support women of color? You know, how can I show up? That's my, that's my atonement, you know, is that I'm showing up. And then it's even more than atonement. It's just my joy. It's yeah. my joy to show up for women of color because we're going to turn this fucking spaceship around together. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> absolutely. Like we, we've already kind of hit to the last question, which was like, what is the advice that you may be willing to give women to check their privilege and, center women of color like what what would you tell someone yeah like don't be afraid of this work don't be afraid of it don't avoid it like well we can't avoid it this is here yeah. this is here and in our faces right now because it's our responsibility for our generation to heal it yeah and so you know, the more we try to avoid and not look at it and you know get all offended by it and it's like the the bigger it gets and the more it's going to consume us. Yeah, absolutely. 
And it's okay. Like it's okay to feel just feel in spaces where women of color are not going to be forced to do the emotional labor for you. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, like when we, I feel like there's this process that you have to go through and at first it's painful and challenging. And then when you get to the other side of that, it's like the sun is shining so brightly, you know, and yeah. there's so many new bridges and new connections that can be made. And there's the world opens up in such a beautiful way when we open our hearts to each other. And so just don't be afraid of doing the work is what I would say. Thank you, Sarah. That was beautiful. Well, that's our time. This was, mm. this was beautiful. I feel like I'll like in my body now. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Um, thank you so much for time with spending time with me today, Sarah, and helping other women unpack their privilege or learn to check their privilege. This was just a surface scratch um, mm -hmm. below. There'll be a link to look into purchasing the co-conspirator workbook or coming to the Bay Area Check Your Privilege rep, uh, web, uh, workshop here at the end of August. Um, awesome. Sarah, where can women find you if they were interested in working with you? Right now, the best place to reach out to me is on Facebook, Sarah Hendlish, S-A-R-A-H, Hendlish, H-E-N-D-L-I-S-H. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Maisha. You're welcome.